<laughs> okay, hey you guys. I think there's a small lag. I hope you can hear me clearly. This is gonna be relatively short, but today we're gonna continue with language and self. It's the last lecture in this series, and then we will do some application for looking at the past paper. Um, so if you go to your slides, it's the same presentation, but you need to scroll down. Um, and we are going to be looking at lecture two. Okay, teens and gender left. So we're looking at how teens use language and how um, we can use linguistics to understand gender differences. It's really interesting. I hope you find it interesting. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we've been talking about sociolects. Sociolects are dialects that are particular to a social group. So when you are investigating sociolects, you can look at someone's age. Are they young? Are they old? You can look at their race and their ethnicity. Right, so AAVE is particular to African Americans. Jamaican Creole is particular to people with a Jamaican heritage. You can also look at gender. Do they um, identify as male or female and how might that impact the way they're using language? Okay, so today we're gonna look more specifically at age and gender. And we're gonna look at how teenagers use language. It's highly probable you will get something on your exam with younger people using language. So you can use the information in this lecture to comment on how young people, young generations are using language. Okay? All right. So a lot of this is from your textbook. If you want to review your textbook, it's pages 186 to 197. It's about 10 pages. I've essentially summarized the most important points here, okay? So teens use technology extensively, more so typically on average than older people. So effortlessly tweeting, texting, and using a variety of apps seamlessly. So if something comes up on your exam where young people are using a language, you can just quote this. Teens use technology extensively, using a variety of apps seamlessly. Okay? So you're commenting on this culture and how it impacts the way language is used, okay? So teens often use text speak. So the language that you use to text your friends often comes out not only in text messages, but maybe in emails, or maybe sometimes in your verbal communication. Also, BRB, LOL, you might actually use these abbreviations in spoken language as well. Like, you can remember John McWhorter's lecture. He was saying that language now is shifting, right? From, a, it's almost like a spoken language is shifting into a written language, like lol and verb. Whereas in the past, it was always the way we speak reflected the way we wrote. Okay, all right. So if you don't remember that, that TED Talk, maybe you wanna go back and read it very relevant for our lecture today. Okay, so text speaks challenges standard English conventions, right? There's more jargon used, there are more abbreviations and acronyms. It's shorter, it's more efficient language, right? Jargon as in language or Lexis that you guys use that I'm not as familiar with. We talked about some of those words last lecture when we were looking at words borrowed from AAVE, like, um, gosh, like bro, and um, it's sick, 
or oh my god i'm an old person trying to use young person language you guys know this better than me okay so but just specific lexus um and less standard punctuation so instead of having commas and periods in the right place you'll notice you probably use more run-on sentences um and less capital letters too Right? So when you start a new sentence, you might not capitalize it. When you use a proper noun like SLK, you might not capitalize it. So this is why a lot of people think this type of text speak is lazy English because it's just more efficient language. So this is, I want to introduce you to these different ways of looking at text speak, right? So the prescriptivist would say like, Language is deteriorating, right? English is deteriorating. These young people can't speak properly and it would infuriate them. So this is what we, we, we can think of this castle. And I have an image here of the crumbling castle. I'll get to this in a second. But the prescriptivists really have this notion that there is a perfect form of English, right? And you can think of it as this castle. And um, a lot of theorists or a lot of linguists and everyday people have argued that English has been declining since this golden era, this castle-like um, metaphor for English in the mid-1900s when it was standardized and it was proper and people knew how to speak it. Now, obviously, there is a huge, so one of the prescriptivists, is, his name is James Milroy, and he wrote an article, Children Can't Speak or Write Properly Anymore. And so what I want you to think of is the, the critique of this is that Milroy is coming from a very privileged and, and prejudiced perspective, right? So what do we mean by that? People with money, with education, who are upper class, have access to proper standard English in their classrooms, with their teachers, in their social communities. And so they're able to use standard English properly. What about people who don't have access to education, right? Um, they're still be, they're still able to communicate and use English effectively. It's just a different version of English. And that's where we start looking at all these different dialects and socialects. Are they bad English or are they just different English? Do we need to add this connotation of inferior or uneducated or not smart or ignorant? Okay, so this is where we can see the, prescript, the prescriptivist approach as sometimes being privileged and prejudiced towards other types of Englishes, okay? Um, ironically, I will add this golden era that Milroy and other prescriptivists talk about. In that golden era, most people couldn't read and write properly. He was really just referring to the elite who could, okay? In actual fact, education and our access to education has increased so much that we are more globally educated now and more able to speak proper English now than we were back in this golden era that Milroy is referring to. Okay, anyways. So that's the prescriptivist idea, this golden era. Okay, so you can refer to it as this golden era. Now the descriptivist, and one example is this um, woman, Jean Atchison. You don't need to remember this, but you do want to, I think it might be helpful for you to remember this idea of the myth of the crumbling castle. So she says, look, there was never a perfect peak golden age. It didn't exist. We just liked the idea of it because it created a standard of what was superior and it made people who were superior feel even more superior and maintain the status quo, right, of superiority and inferiority. But she's saying, and a lot of descriptivists say, look, there was never a perfect peak age. There was never a castle to start with, okay? It, so if there was never a castle to start with, it's not actually crumbling. Like McWhorter would argue, it's language, it's changing, it's adapting, it's evolving, 
It's a living, breathing thing that's not meant to be contained and codified and perfected in one book that holds the rules, right? That we need to allow it to evolve. That's the descriptivist mentality. And remember, you can look at Labov's um, Harlem study, and he was really more of a descriptivist saying, look, the prescriptivist would have said those African-American kids are inferior and they are not using language properly. But what he's saying is, look, um, the younger generation isn't corrupting our language. They're just using it differently. Okay, and same with McWhorter. It's just a new sociolect. Um, you can also use lexical gap theory to better understand, look, we're just using new words to adapt to, to new current events, okay? Okay, moving on. I wanted to just drop this in as a thought to ponder. Go ahead and read it. Even if you say you're not discriminating, I'm not racist, oftentimes people will still judge you based on the language that you use. So that's what this author is saying. Look, we're not supposed to be discriminating anybody based on their color, their religion but we still do it with language and it's almost still the only way that we can still discriminate in a, in a more acceptable way. Okay, so how do teens use language? This all comes down to digital communities because teens, like we said, are accessing technology more than any other community. Right? So I want you to just think, I've got some questions here for you. Do you follow any Instagram, TikTok accounts? Do you watch any channels on YouTube? Do you belong to any fan groups? Think specifically about fan groups because fan groups, like I said, have here, they have specific lexical items, right? Gryffindor, Hogwarts. If you haven't read Harry Potter, an outsider would think you were losing your mind using these words, right? Midfield, yellow card, what do these mean? If you don't watch football, they don't make sense. So think about lexical items or jargon that is particular to a fan base, right? And think about how those communities use that lexis to build belonging, acceptance, um, and a sense of like that membership card. You belong here, you understand. Um, we are including you, and if you don't understand it, you are excluded. And that's good because it creates this tight community of understanding, of mutual understanding. It, it lends linguistic cohesion to a group, jargon, okay? Um, and like I said, it excludes others that aren't. Teens use slang. Look, we all use slang, but teens are stereotyped as using slang way more. Slang, are, we can think of this as in-group identity markers. So when you use slang, what does that mean? It means I've tagged you as a certain identity. I can mark your identity based on the slang that you're speaking. I know you're a young person, for example. Or if you're using MLE, I know you're a young person from London, probably. Or, you know, it depends if you're using a particular slang for a particular fan group. I know you are a young person at a football tournament. Okay? So anyways, slang is used as a badge of identity. When I use it, I associate with a particular identity or a particular community. If I were to start speaking like um, one of you guys using slang, like dropping all these um, words that only young people use, you would look at me like, Miss Brad, what the heck? I don't belong to this community, so I don't use that language, right? Okay, so it's often restricted to a certain group. Okay, create shared understanding. So if I were to use slang, 
If I were a young person, you would probably be more likely to accept me into your social group. So there's pressure, there's social pressure to adapt and use that language of the social group. Back in the day, my generation, when I was your age, we said things like, don't have a cow, that's Bart Simpson, that's bananas, Gwen Stefani from No Doubt actually never really said that, but whatever. This idea of being a, a hip was, I think, maybe more my parents' generation, but we transformed this into the idea of a hipster. I think you guys still maybe use that word, but that was more my era. Okay. Um, there's a lot of portmanteau slang, remember, when you're bringing words together. Brad and Angelina, Brangelina, gigantic, enormous, ginormous. Brother, romance, bromance. Okay, you guys get it. Anyways, I just want you to think about slang and how it's used today because it could potentially come up on your exam. You can think of how slang is sometimes offensive. Oftentimes it's abbreviated or using acronyms. If you want to think of any acronyms that you use, um, we've already said BRB and LOL, but I remember like my students had to teach me like ROTL when you're rolling on the floor. Like there are just so many different um, new acronyms coming into this um, sociolect, teenage sociolect. Okay, so here's an important concept, code switching. Quote, code switching means when you effortless, effortlessly switch the level of your register, depending on your audience. So that's like you're in the lunch or in the canteen and you're hanging out with your friends and you're speaking as you would using your sociolect that's appropriate for your community, which builds belonging and inclusion. And then Ms. Bride comes up and is like, oh, hey, wants to say something. And you guys are like, uh, and then maybe the conversation that you have with me switches to a, a a slightly more formal register, one that would include me, right? So that I would understand what you're saying. So you're constantly switching, code switching. Okay. Um, an interesting idea, teenage sociolect, it's stigmatized by school institutions. What do I mean by that? Proper educational institutions, like SLK, for example, will often look at the way you speak with your friends, like, oh my gosh, they, they can't speak English. Like, they're not using language properly. Sometimes um, teachers will look down on that kind of language, like, oh, it's not proper. It's very prescriptivist, right? Um, but the interesting thing is you guys, when you use it, there's an advantage because you, it's considered covert prestige. If you use it within your group, you're getting, you're earning prestige within your group. You're using language covertly, right? It's not proper and that's what gives it its value because it's covert prestige. It's like challenging the status quo is what gives you that added value of your sociolect. It increases your status when you use it within your group, okay? So from an outsider's perspective, like a proper institution, it's low level, but from within your social group, it gives you higher status. Hope that makes sense. Okay, so that's teenagers. Now we're gonna switch to looking at gender. So gender left, linguistics of gender. That's it, that's why they put these two words together. Gender left is a way of understanding um, the way genders use the language, okay? So here's this idea that language reflects and reinforces society's social hierarchies and power dynamics. You can write that down. You can pause it if you want. The way we use language says something about society. So the way I use language as a woman reflects something about how society views women. And then the way I'm using it can also reinforce these power dynamics. It'll make sense in a second, I'll show you. So stereotypically, women have been considered 
over the centuries, and it is changing, but typically we have been considered more subservient. And you know this word subservient? Subservient, it's like a servant to be lower than, to obey something more dominant, which is a man. We've had certain career restrictions, right? If you look at the Supreme Court, if you look at any position of political power, nine times out of 10, there's a man there. There are exceptions, it is changing, okay? But what I'm saying is historically, women have been considered subservient, less capable of holding positions of power, and limited in our ability to participate in democracy. It took us longer to vote. It took us longer to participate in lots of ways. Okay, so God and mankind is one example. When you read a religious text, God is referred to as a man. Okay, when you read the Bible and there is reference to mankind. There's no explanation that says mankind or womankind. The assumption is that women are included in this concept of man. But we label it as man and the woman is just assumed to tag along and be included in it, right? Okay, so do you see how the way, just how we're framing this omniscient, amazing power as a man? And um, I'm sorry, I hope that this, this isn't, it's controversial, right? So I'm just gonna lay it out there. This is what the argument is, whether you agree with it or not. Um, but typically, men have been used the way we, the way we use language reinforces this idea of man is superior and dominant. Okay. It's just historic, it's a historical fact. All right, so this is where we can look at pronouns. He and she are gendered pronouns, right? We have he, she, it. Those are our three, pro three main pronouns, they also. It and they are, are neutral, right? Like if you're talking about a dog and you don't know if it's a girl or a boy, you can call it it. Right? Um, but typically when you're referring to a person, you're going to refer to a gendered pronoun. He went to the park, not it went to the park. That would be weird. Unless it's a baby and you don't know his gender. Have you guys ever done that? Like, it's really cute because you don't know if it's a he or she. Okay, but typically we're using gendered pronouns. And gendered pronouns are identity markers, right? They're gonna tell us, do you associate as a man or as a woman? So, he is often assumed to include the female perspective. I don't have emoticons on this, so this is why I just wrote insert annoyed emoticon face, where it's like, ugh. We do this all the time, and we still do this, right? In textbooks, um, in like um, manuals where you read instructions. So this idea, in a textbook, for example, you might read the sentence, the structure of a language will impact how he sees the world. So we just assume that he also represents a woman. Very rarely will you see she, and the assumption is that she will represent a man. Does it make sense? I hope it makes sense. Okay. And boys, I, please, um, I know this is coming from a female perspective, this is just the way society has been structured. It's not your fault. We're working on it, we're progressing, and we're gonna work on it together, men and women together. So don't, I hope you don't feel like this is an attack. I'm really just trying to explain historically how language has really shaped power dynamics. Okay, so um, covert sexism. This is like hidden sexism. Covert means like hidden, right? Um, covert sexism means sexism is inserted into the language in such a subtle way that you almost don't realize you're doing it, right? Because it just becomes part of your everyday vernacular, your everyday usage of language. So like when we say, oh, um, my friend is a businessman, Okay, 
We assume, obviously, that this is a man because we have the suffix, the gender mark suffix man, okay? And then we have these connotations of, oh, success and seniority, right? Um, why not call it a business person? We're starting to get there. We're starting to become more politically correct. If this person was a woman, you would have to say businesswoman or businessman, but she's a woman, right? But the assumption really is that if you hold this status of, of being a business person, you are a man because that's the default gender of this, of this, of this word, of this noun. Okay. Likewise, certain professions are usually gendered towards women, certain prof helping professions, right? So like if I say the nurse, you know in your mind you're thinking of a woman. If I say, um, if I'm referring to somebody who's helping somebody on an airplane, typically we use the word stewardess or waitress, right? So these words are typically gendered towards females, right? And obviously they have this lower status of serving. All right, so what happens if a nurse is actually a man? Would you just call him a nurse? My friend is a nurse. Or would you um, qualify it with saying he's a male nurse? Because I know that your assumption is that I'm talking about a woman. So when we modify this now, it's because we're aware that there is a, a stereotype or an expectation that that nurse is a woman. And I need to tell you it's a man. Do you get it? So this is covert sex, sexism, the assumption that certain characteristics are assigned to a particular gender. That business people are men and that helping professions are women, typically. All right, so this brings us to the next big question. Do women use language differently? Do we? And I want to introduce you to three theories that might help you. Robin Lackoff, deficit model. One way you can remember this, lack, deficit. Deficit means to not have enough, right? But just note there's no C in her name. It's just Lackoff with a K. Robin Lackoff the deficit model. These all build on each other. Obar and Atkins, they were talking about powerless language. And Deborah Cameron, Deborah diversity. Deborah Cameron, the diversity approach. Okay, let's go, let's look. Uh, you do not have to memorize all these, please don't freak out. But this is Robin Lackoff's deficit approach. So she believed women aren't able to use powerful language. When women speak, they don't use powerful language. She did tons of studies comparing how men and women speak. And she saw that men were typically more dominant in their language and women were typically more passive, subservient, um, less assertive, right? So she found these 10 characteristics to help describe how women were speaking, okay? And so this is what she calls the deficit model, that we are at a deficit that we're not assuming a position of power, that we are lacking power. The way we use language reflects our lack of power. So we use hedges, it's kind of, I'm gonna exaggerate, okay, so you guys can get a sense of how women use language. I use a lot of these, I'm gonna be honest. And ladies, you can self-reflect also. How do you use language? How does your mom use language? Boys, you can think about how the women in your life use language. Emphatic stress, there is more emphatic stress, more emphasis on certain words. So late. Intensifiers, it's super hard. He's such a great guy. So we exaggerate or intensify certain adjectives. Super such great. Okay, tag questions. Instead of saying it's hard, it's hard, right? I want your approval. 
rising into nation and declaration and declaratives. I don't want to, right? Um, so instead of just saying and declaring what you want, you hear an intonation towards the end. And that suggests that you're unsure of yourself. Okay. Um, empty adjective, sweet, cute, great. Cute is, a, is one that a lot of women use. Overly polite forms, okay? So Lakoff found that women are more likely to use polite forms. Could you possibly pass the salt, please? Whereas a man would say, pass the salt. More, more um, direct, more firm, more confident. Whereas a woman feels like she needs to appease, she needs to use these hedges. She, she doesn't really assume her position of power, so she needs to ask super politely for someone to help her. Okay, hypergrammatic grammar. Okay, so we're just, we use grammar better than men. That's what Lakoff found. And we're less likely to swear or use offensive language. Again, this goes back to being polite instead of saying, oh, we said, oh, sure. Um, precise color terms, so we're just more, <laughs> this, is, this one always makes me laugh. We're, we're um, more specific in the way we're able to describe um, color than men. Men would just say it's pink. Okay. So here's the super interesting part is that, so let me go back. This was Lakoff's deficit approach. Women aren't able to use power, powerful language. Now, what Obar and Atkins did was they, was they questioned that. Why aren't women using powerful language? Is it true? They actually were also asking, is this true? Does this hold up? So what they did was they looked at a court and they actually examined 150 hours of courtroom interactions. You don't need to memorize these facts. I'm just giving you the general idea. The most important is their conclusion, but let me just frame it for you so you know their study. So they, looked at these courtroom interactions between the judge and between the defendants and between the lawyers and how everyone was using language in the courtroom. And they wanted to get a sense of how they were using language, who had power and who didn't, and was it gendered? So were the women always more likely to take this more submissive language and the men more likely to be more dominant? So they were, what they did was they actually, they went through all of the transcriptions and they coded it. So they identified, is this more female gendered language or male gendered language? Just then they were using Lakoff's 10 principles, right? So they would, oh, excuse me. So they would code, for example, every time they saw a hedge or uh, emphatic stress or overly polite form, for example, okay? So they were looking for these gendered items. And then they gave everybody, uh, each speaker a score. And they were trying to see, is it gender? Is it really based on a person's gender? And this is what they found. It wasn't gender. It was actually about experience and status. So the judge would not use women's gender left. Who would? The defendant who felt like they were being oppressed or felt like they were being accused or felt like they were treated as inferior. So what's the conclusion? That the way we use language is simply a reflection of the power we feel in society. It is not inherent to a gender. A woman doesn't just use this language because she's a woman. She uses it because she feels powerless in that social, particular social environment. And this is why they call it powerless language. It's not specific to a woman. You put somebody in a hot seat that feels pressured or inferior or like their voice isn't as important and they're gonna use those same lack of principles. Yeah? Okay, I did this to see if you could remember what the theorist's name is. Do you remember? Obar and Atkins. Maybe you can think of bar like the bar exam for lawyers. 
Ovar and Atkins. So this is their conclusion. The way women speak is not a reflection of just being a woman. It's not inherent in their, in their person. It's not just the way women are, are born to speak. <laughs> So this has to do with behaviorism, right? How the environment, our social environment, um, gives us certain feedback about how we are expected to show up and use language. And so according to Obar and Atkins, the language that women use is simply a reflection of patriarchy, of this learned submission that my voice is less powerful than a man, so I should speak this way. I will be more accepted. And you hear stories about this all the time, of like, um, women, for example, lawyers or business women who go into a room and as soon as they start speaking like a man, they're looked at as bossy, rude, offensive. But it's when a man uses that same language, he's seen as dominant and confident, all these positive connotations, right? So a woman over time learns in order for me to be accepted, I need to use this kind of language. Okay, women are not given as many opportunities or safe spaces to feel powerful, so they speak indirectly and they give up their power. This is their conclusion. Men use more powerful constructions because they assume they have the right to more space and power. Okay. So do you guys remember Milroy, his social network theory? He did this study, it's called his famous Belfast study, um, and it's called the Belfast study because it was in Ireland. And he looked at women and men, and he noticed um, at home, women were really abiding by this particular gender elect, which was super polite forms, um, very standard English, the women at home were using those forms. What happened was um, in the factories and in the industries in Belfast, I can't remember, I think there was a war, but a lot of the men left and the women took their places in these factories. And he started studying how the way women were using language was changing now that they were at work in these, in these factories and not just stuck at home all the time. So what did Milroy find? Milroy found once they were in these smaller, denser networks with other women, they became more comfortable using a stronger version of the local dialect. Do you guys remember the strong tie theory of the dense social networks? So when they were in these denser social networks, women started assuming um, a stronger dialect, right? And that included more slang and more relaxed language, for example, than what they were using at home. Okay, so this is just another example of how the environment changes the way we speak, regardless of what gender we are. Okay, so cool, we're almost done, you guys. I wanna introduce you to Deborah Cameron. She's a badass feminist, and she is known for her diversity approach. She wrote a book called Feminism and Linguistic Theory. Here's a picture of her. And you can just read this. Basically, her conclusion is, and I think a lot of theorists, a lot of linguists would probably agree with her, you can't assume all women are gonna operate the same way. So gender elect, we need to be careful when we're stereotyping and we're generalizing. Oh, women speak like this and men speak like that. It's not always like that. It depends on the woman. It depends on the, the country. It depends on the workplace. It depends on so many other, it depends on that woman's personal history or ideologue, right? So we should avoid generalizing is what she's saying. And she's saying our expectations of how people will use language actually reinforces the way they use it. What does that mean? So for example, if I expect all women to be inferior and subservient and use that type of gender left, I am going to reinforce that notion and women will probably continue using it. Whereas if I were to say, Meh, 
use what you want, use what feels good in that context. We're not confined and we're not limited to our gender and the stereotypes of how we're expected to use it. I can be more fluid. I can also code switch. Maybe I use a little bit more gender left in certain situations. Or maybe I challenge that and I bring a really dominant self to a certain environment, right? So what she's saying is you can't assume all women will operate the same way and that we shouldn't have expectations around how certain genders use language because if we do, we could actually just be reinforcing the, that dynamic, that power dynamic. That's it, we're done. I hope this was useful, I hope it was interesting and I'm gonna sign off, I hope you took notes.